Hello friends, my name is Benjamin. In this video I want to tell a story that you will remember for a long time. A story about the life and brutal death of a young 27-year-old mom of two babies. Laura Ackerson was born April 30th, 1984. In 2011, when she was 27 years old, she was living in Kingston, North Carolina with her husband of 32 years, Grant Hayes, and their two sons, three and two-year-old. Laura loved children very much, and so her own children she just adored. Laura met her husband in 2007. Grant was a musician who played in bars and restaurants. Laura was working at the bar at the time, and that's where they met. Grant was a popular local musician and very charming. They started dating, but Laura kept it a secret from friends and family until one day she told them that she had married him. Friends were shocked, especially Laura's best friend, Heidi. She always thought they shared everything that was going on in their lives with each other. Jason, Laura's brother, was also shocked. No one knew about Grant or who he was. The wedding seemed too rushed. But despite all this, those around them supported Laura's decision. A few months later, Laura became pregnant with a baby boy. She was very happy, but Grant began to behave strangely. Heidi's best friend and Laura's brother, Jason, noticed that Grant was very quiet, always angry, felt like he didn't like anyone, and didn't like socializing with people. Then Grant began to control Laura and her every move. Grant began to insinuate to her that everyone she loved and everyone she trusted was a bad influence on her. He would yell at her during her phone calls with friends and family to hang up, to stop talking to them, because they were a bad influence on her. When Jason came over, Grant would start yelling at her to kick her brother out, that she wasn't allowed to be in his company. Laura had to go out with her friends in secret from her husband. Grant turned out to be an abuser who tried to isolate her from society so that she would belong only to him. Some believed that he isolated her from her friends because they could see the real him and could influence Laura to try to persuade her to leave him. Grant also began acting strangely toward his son. He refused to immunize the baby, explaining that African-American children were more likely to be autistic. Grant began to use alcohol and illegal substances. He had always used illegal substances, but once he married Lore, he stopped using. But after the baby was born, he went back to those horrible substances. He began to think more about his business and had little time for his wife. He went on long business trips and dated other women for work. Because of the illegal substances, or because of some mental illness or disorder that the illegal substances exacerbated, Grant began to have even more bizarre thoughts. He claimed that he was the chosen one, and that the government was run by aliens, and that they needed to make a lot of money to get on a spaceship that would only take the chosen ones during the apocalypse. He didn't listen to Laura. They started arguing all the time. He justified his cheating by saying he needed connections for work, then he gets a business offer in the Virgin Islands. Grant decides to go to the island, leaving Laura and Baby in North Carolina. There, he meets a woman named Amanda. Amanda was an actress and seven years older than Grant, and she was also rich, as she was a widow and got all of her husband's money. Grant did not hide Amanda from Laura and said that Amanda was just a tool for his business. Laura, by then, couldn't stand to be treated this way and she wanted to leave Grant. Grant's family told Laura that she needed to get away from him and run far away. Laura planned to move in with her brother Jason, but something happened that she didn't see coming. She became pregnant with her second child. Because of this, she changed her mind and decided to stay with Grant. She moved to the Virgin Islands with him, and there she gave birth to her second son. The baby had health problems and needed quality medical care, so they moved back to North Carolina. Grant wasn't thrilled about the move. He kept thinking about business in the Virgin Islands, then he started using illegal substances and alcohol even more, and became even worse at manipulating people, using them for his own ends, not thinking about anyone but himself. At this time, Amanda, from the islands, moves to New York. Grant continues to socialize with her, and humiliates Laura in every possible way. In the same room with Laura, he told Amanda on the phone that he loved her 
and wanted to marry her. Soon, he began to leave for New York, explaining that there were more business opportunities there. However, Grant wanted to go there to be with Amanda. He left Laura at home with the children. By this point, Laura had lost all patience. Not only was Grant forever humiliating her and cheating on her all the time, he spent virtually no time with his family, no attention to them, disappearing all the time. While Laura was planning to leave her husband, Grant wanted to take her eldest son to New York for a couple of days for a photo shoot for a diaper commercial. Laura didn't want to give her consent. Still, Laura wanted the children to have a good relationship with their father. She gave her son to Grant, but he wasn't returned after a couple days. A week later, Laura saw numerous pictures from Grant and Amanda's wedding on Facebook. Laura, shocked, called him asking, You're married to me. What wedding? To which Grant replied, I'm not married to you. I didn't sign any papers. After this statement by Grant, Laura finds their marriage certificate, and indeed there was no Grant's signature on it. Thus, they were never married. For almost four years, Laura lived a lie. Laura was in a panic and didn't know what to do or how to get back the son he wouldn't give. Eventually, Grant and Amanda sued to get custody of Laura's sons, but Laura received no invitation to the hearing. Grant appeared alone before the judge, stating that Laura was a terrible mother and that their sons should be in Grant and Amanda's custody. The court ruled in Grant's favor. Thirty days before the trial itself, the court also took Laura's youngest son away from her and gave him to Grant and Amanda. Most likely, the court granted Grant's request for custody because Laura did not have a job and did not have her own place to live. But Laura didn't give up. She got a job, found an apartment in a very safe neighborhood with a security system. She was willing to do anything for her children. At this time, Grant and Amanda were moving to Raleigh, North Carolina to deal with custody. When the trial came, Laura had everything prepared. She needed to get her children back. She was helped by a friend, Heidi, who was a lawyer. Laura was going to tell the court about Grant's over-control of her, his addictions, his manipulation of people, and that he had a mental disorder. Laura believed that Grant had sociopathy. Laura provided all of this information to the court, and the judge decided that a psychological evaluation of both parents would be needed in this case. This analysis or examination also included observing how the parents and children interacted with each other. For several months, there was a court battle. Laura tried not to give up. She knew she had to cooperate with Grant for the sake of the children. She was allowed to spend time with the children on the weekends, and she was allowed to talk to them on the phone every day. But Grant was making things difficult. He distracted the kids, played loud music during phone calls, and constantly complained to everyone about his ex-wife. Laura recorded and saved everything, all emails and all voicemails. She was very serious about custody. She recorded everything she did with the kids, what she played, what she fed them, what time she put them to bed. The fact of the matter is that Grant, on a regular basis, and publicly accused her of being a bad mother. He accused her of making the kids sick, not feeding them, and even hitting them. Even called the police once because a child came home with a bruise. As time went on, Laura began to receive dire threats from Grant. She told her friend Heidi that if anything happened to her, whether it was an accident or even a natural death, it would be Grant's fault. When the results of the psychological evaluation came back, Laura turned out to be a very good, wonderful mom. They had a great bond with the children. The kids adored her. In Laura's favor was that she had a stable job and income, whereas Grant's evaluation was not successful. He did not have a good bond with the children, which is natural since children get attached to someone who cares for them. Grant never once sat with them. He also often spoke hatefully of Laura, saying some horrible things about her. As a result, the woman who conducted the assessment recommended further psychological evaluation of Grant due to his impaired thinking. Also impacted was the fact that Grant and Amanda didn't have stable jobs. Plus, they had a daughter. After that, 
both parents were given the same amount of time to spend with their children. Almost no one believed Grant anymore since there was no proof of his empty accusations towards Laura. Grant was very angry. A court date was set, but unfortunately Laura did not live to see it. Grant would sometimes let Laura, on Wednesdays after work, take the kids to a children's center. But after the results of a psychological evaluation, he stopped allowing her that time on Wednesdays. On July 13th, however, Grant allowed Laura to meet with the children. This was a joyous and unexpected event for Laura. She did all her chores for the day and had several appointments. Then she called her friend and told her that she was on her way to meet the children now. And after that, they could meet up. Also in the evening, she was supposed to call her friend co-worker Siobhan Mathis about their business together. However, Laura never called either girl. Siobhan didn't wait for Laura to call and started calling herself, but couldn't get through. However, after a couple days, she became worried and decided to drive by Laura's house. That's when she saw that Laura's car was not in front of the house. She waited another two days, but there was no answer from Laura. Siobhan then decided to ask the landlord to open the apartment Laura was renting and see if anything had happened to her. They entered the apartment, but no one was there. Siobhan then asked to take a couple of Laura's diaries, as she knew that Laura wrote down absolutely everything in those diaries for her own safety. On Monday, July 18th, Siobhan went to the police station and filed a missing persons report. She provided the police with the diaries and stated that Laura was now fighting for custody of the children and that she was very worried about the safety of Laura's life. The police read her journal, her thoughts about Grant, about her safety, and the cops became worried too. The police checked the security cameras at Laura's apartment complex. Laura was last seen there Wednesday, July 13th at 9 a.m. She was leaving the apartment with all of her belongings. They checked her appointments throughout the day and she had been everywhere, met with everyone, everything in her diary she had completed. She made her last phone call to Grant at 5 p.m., when she was three kilometers from his house. The police contacted Grant by phone. He spoke calmly and confidently. He was asked when he had last seen Laura, and he said that she had come to pick up the children at 6.40 p.m., and that she was to take them to Children's Center and spend time with them there. But first, he wanted to discuss the details of custody. Grant stated that Laura agreed to give him full custody of the children if he would give her $25,000. She then left with the children and returned them between 9 and 9.30 p.m. At 10.15 p.m. she left, and that was the last time he saw her. Grant further testified that he was to deliver the children to Laura on Friday. He arrived at their usual drop-off location, but Laura never showed up. The police checked the surveillance cameras from that location, and indeed it can be seen that Grant arrived with the children and as he did not wait for Laura, he left. His story kind of checks out. Police haven't gotten a chance to talk to Grant in person yet. Everything so far has been happening over the phone. Grant was very much avoiding meeting with police officers, and that was very suspicious. The police had been monitoring Laura's bank account and her phone in case they were being used. But all was quiet from Wednesday. On July 20th, Laura's car was found. It was parked outside the apartment complex where Grant and Laura had lived in the past, before Amanda. The inside of the car was washed clean, not a single print. The police then decided to check Grant's cell phone and found out that he was not in North Carolina, as he had said all along. He was in the Texas. The two investigators decided to make the 18-hour trip to Texas to find out what Grant was doing there. While they were on Grant's trail, a search warrant was obtained for Grant and Amanda's apartment in Raleigh on the grounds that Grant had been banned by the court from leaving the state with his children. He had violated this during the disappearance of his ex-wife, with whom he is suing. Bleach stain remover was found at the entrance to the apartment. The entire apartment smelled like detergent. There were furniture marks on the carpet. Also, one of the bathrooms was missing an item, and it smelled like bleach again. The bedding was removed from the mattress, but unfortunately anything that the police could take as a sample for examination gave no answers. 
Also found in the apartment was a letter in two different handwritings stating that Laura was giving full custody of the children to Grant for $25,000. One handwriting was indeed Laura's, the other, Grant's. Everyone who knew Laura unanimously agreed that Laura would never sign anything like that in her life. Everyone had seen her fight for the kids. When the detectives finally reached Texas, Grant and Amanda and the kids had already driven back. It turned out that Amanda's sister Karen lived in Texas. Detectives interviewed her and she had some very interesting things to say. According to her, Amanda and her new husband Grant, whom Amanda's family had never seen, had suddenly and unexpectedly decided to come to visit. They brought a truckload of various items with coolers, furniture, and suitcases. To all of Amanda's relatives, Grant seemed very strange. Amanda and Grant asked the relatives strange questions. They asked if there were any plots of land nearby with holes. They asked about the well in the yard, how deep it was. At one point, Amanda, in confidence, told Karen that she had caused Laura a lot of pain and didn't know what to do, but couldn't give details. The detectives asked Karen if she thought Laura's body could have been somewhere in the truck, and with tears in her eyes and hysterical, Karen said yes. Then she told investigators to check the river that runs near her house. There, Amanda and Grant suddenly decided to go boating. It was very strange, only because Karen's house had invited guests to see Amanda, whom no one had seen in a long time. But Amanda ditched all the guests at the very beginning and went for a boat ride. The police started searching Karen's house and property, and divers were sent to search the river. Karen showed the police the machete that had been left behind by Grant and Amanda, which she had picked up with a towel and hidden in a wall in the garage. She did this in case it might be in evidence. She also kept an unwashed towel that Grant had asked her for to wash something of her truck. Karen's son told police that Grant and Amanda also questioned him. They tried to ask him about the local animals and whether alligators lived near the river and where there was usually a large gathering of them and if they could eat a whole person, how fast. They also asked if sharks lived along the coast. The divers were hampered by water lilies during their search, but they were able to find several white objects floating among the lilies. In the water, the police began to find the body piece by piece. At first, it was parts of the torso, part of the leg, part of the arm, and finally they found the head. At Karen's home, they found items that Amanda and Grant had left behind, and one of them was a receipt from the store. They bought salty acid, gloves, and a large garbage can at the store. Grant and Amanda arrived at Grant's parents' house back in North Carolina at this time, and the police had already obtained a warrant to seize the phones and the truck from them. Grant was calm and confident as he handed over the items. He didn't realize that the police had already found the remains. Although the body had not yet been identified, police had enough evidence to arrest Grant and Amanda on murder charges. On July 25th, they arrested Grant and Amanda. When questioned, Amanda and Grant's statements differed, kept changing, and eventually they began pointing at each other. Grant stated that Amanda accidentally killed Laura, and he was only covering for Amanda because he wanted to protect her and was scared. Amanda claimed that she was one of Grant's victims, like Laura, a victim of his control, aggression, and manipulation. According to her, Grant killed Laura, and Amanda was afraid to tell and only obeyed him. The police at this time needed to find more evidence to accurately charge and try them. They contacted the trash companies and found Grant's trash that had already been removed from his property. There they found gloves, women's jeans, women's underwear, masks, a vacuum cleaner, a shower curtain, a towel in bleach, and they found a drop of blood on a glove. The result of DNA testing showed that it was Laura's blood. However, it was unknown who used the glove. Also, Amanda's blood was found on the boat that Grant and Amanda went for a ride in Texas. The identity of the body found in the river in Texas was confirmed by dental records that it was unfortunately Laura. It was also determined that the body had been decomposing in hydrochloric acid for some time. It was clear from the receipt that they were buying that acid. 
Later, a surveillance camera in Texas showed Amanda throwing away the acid residue after they're in a boat ride. Laura's body was in terrible condition, so it was impossible to determine the cause of death. There were obvious deep stab wounds that left marks on the bones. From the analysis of the neck and head, experts believe that death by strangulation is quite possible. There was also a sharp object wound to the neck. According to Grant's story, when Laura arrived Wednesday to pick up the children, she and Amanda began arguing. Grant was in another room at the time, and Amanda accidentally killed Laura. According to him, he only saw Laura killed when he had already entered the room. Despite Grant saying that he was only covering for Amanda, police officers didn't believe it. The Thursday after Laura disappeared, he drove to Walmart at 2 a.m. and bought a reciprocating saw some blades, a tarp, and a gym bag. According to Amanda on Wednesday, when Laura arrived with the children, Amanda was watching cartoons with the children in the bedroom. At this time, Laura and Grant were discussing child custody in the kitchen. At one point, Amanda walked into the kitchen and saw Laura signing some paper. She got curious and went over and asked what the paper was, and when Amanda realized what it was, she got angry because they didn't have $25,000. According to Amanda, Laura walked towards her, tripped, and then Grant grabbed her thinking she was attacking Amanda. The two of them ended up falling. Laura hit her head, and Amanda ran into the bedroom to the kids. Grant came into the bedroom five minutes later and said that Laura had hit her head hard and that he needed to call an ambulance, so he told Amanda to get the kids and leave the apartment with her eyes closed. She took the children to eat fast food, where a surveillance camera recorded her. Then she came home and Grant was just sitting on the couch. He said he was fine. No ambulance was needed and Laura went home. The next morning, Amanda found that Grant wasn't home. She tried calling him and Laura, but no one answered. Amanda asked her daughter Shaw to watch the children and went to get groceries. There, she received a phone call from Grant, who asked her to buy bleach and gloves. Grant later suggested that Amanda go to Texas to visit her relatives, but they did not leave on Friday. Amanda claimed that at the time, she had no idea that Laura had died and that her body was lying in coolers in their truck bed. While they were visiting Karen, Amanda noticed Grant walking around the yard at night. So she went downstairs and asked him what was wrong. He said Laura was dead. It was only at that point that Amanda learned the truth. According to her, Grant said it was her responsibility to help him dispose of Laura's body. They then drove to the river, deciding to feed the remains of the body to an alligator since the acid didn't work. According to Amanda, on the way back to North Carolina, Grant was paranoid and carried a machete. However, the police knew that his machete was in the wall in Karen's garage. Much of Amanda's testimony did not match the facts. On August 26, 2013, the court found Grant guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced him to life in prison without parole. Amanda was found guilty of second-degree murder and sentenced to 13 to 16 years in prison. In 2014, Amanda filed for divorce. In 2017, 20 years was added to her sentence for tampering with evidence and pipes. During the trials, neither Amanda nor Grant showed an ounce of regret or remorse. Grant was smiling and cheerful during the hearings. Amanda and Grant still maintain that Laura's death was an accident, and they both still point the finger at each other. But it is believed that it was carefully planned by both of them. Laura was afraid of both of them. She reported to the police that she feared for her life and received dire threats from Grant. Also, Laura would not go into Grant and Amanda's apartment if Grant would purposely lure her there to kill her. Many believe that Grant decided to kill Laura because he needed further psychological analysis and he knew that he would definitely lose the child custody battle afterward. After the trial, custody of all three children went to Grant's parents. What do you think? Was this crime planned? Unfortunately, it's a common story in life. People who are in love don't see who they really are. Perhaps if Laura had taken her time with the wedding or left this horrible man, this wouldn't have happened right away. Share your opinions in the comments. 
Thanks for watching and for being with us. Take care of yourself and your loved ones.